So welcome to another video in this series. So in this video, we're just going to really quickly take a look at um, chapter one for microeconomics in year one. And we'll be taking a look at the definitions for the nature of economics. So in this chapter, um, there's quite a few basic terms that you need to kind of understand. And it's really important you get the handle of these because these are the kinds of definitions that you'll be using for the rest of your um, economics chapters. So it's quite important that you get these chapters. Um, these definitions correct right at the very beginning. So we'll just jump right into it. So in this series, we'll just basically go through really quickly explaining this um, sheet and explaining what the different definitions are. I've also provided a link to this sheet in the description below, so you can probably print it off and use it for your own revision. So yeah, let's go straight into it. So the first thing you've probably heard of is something called Cetras Paribus. And the idea of Cetras Paribus, as we say, this is where all other things are remaining the same. What this means is in economics, it's a very complicated subject. So it can often be quite difficult for us to understand how like one economic theory can affect the economy. Because if you change one thing, that will affect one thing in the economy, which will affect something else, which affects something else. And it's quite hard to understand how that one thing that you changed, what specific effect it had. So we usually say when using a theory that we're going to use the idea of such as Paribus, saying that if we make a change in this economic principle, then let's assume that all the other factors aren't affected and we'll just take a look how like factor x affects factor y so yeah such as paribus is all other things remaining the same uh, x affects y without all these other things on the side we kind of ignore all these other things going around and we just look at this part so next thing we need to understand is what are positive statements so the key thing for positive statements is that it's an objective statement which can be proven to be true or false using facts now the important part here is this part a positive statement is only a positive statement because it can be proven to be true or false and you can do that using a fact. So if I say that, for example, um, I am 22 years old, then I can easily check that fact by looking up online or finding out my passport and seeing when I was born. So that is um, a positive statement because I can use a fact to say whether I'm saying the truth or I'm saying something which is false, but it can be checked up. Now, the opposite of that is usually considered a normative statement. And this is a subjective statement, which is based on a value judgment. And the key thing here is that you cannot prove it to be true or false. So usually normative statements are opinions, which is saying something like, I don't think that we should have voted to leave the um, EU, or I don't think we should do this. It's something which is not right or is not wrong, but it's just based on an opinion. After that, we have something which is called needs. So what are needs? So needs are something that you need to survive. So this can be food, water, warmth, or shelter. So it's kind of in the word itself. A need is something which you need in order to survive. These are like your basic necessities, if you want to think of it that way. And then you've also got something called wants. So a want is something which you don't need to survive necessarily, but it would improve your standard of living. An example of this might be a phone. You don't need a phone to survive, but if you did have a phone, you could communicate with people, use the internet and that would improve your standard of living. So you tend to look at needs and wants together and essentially um, that's where you take a look at them. So after that we've got this idea of taking a look at scarcity. So what is scarcity? You might have heard a lot of it in your um, economics lessons. So scarcity is where you have a shortage of economic resources compared to the infinite human wants which you have. So that means you have to decide how to allocate resources. What this means is that because we have so many economic resources, the problem is that these are all finite. So we only have so many trees in the world. We only have so much oil in the world. We only have so much labor in the world. And the amount of stuff that people want is almost infinite. People want a lot of things, but we don't have so many um, resources to actually meet these demands of the people. So we have to decide, okay, what do we do with the resources we have? If we wanted to give in to everyone's needs, well, we don't have enough resources to do that. So the key part here is that people have a lot of things that they want. I only have so many resources. How am I going to allocate these resources to all the different needs? So that's the idea of scarcity. That's what it means. So now the next few things are looking at like factors of production. So actually, before we take a look at these four, it'd probably make more sense to take a look at what is a factor of production. So factors of production are known as labor, land, capital, and enterprise. These are things which you can use to produce you know, goods and services. These are how you can you know produce in an economy so labor is a factor of production which is known as human capital so labor is just essentially your workforce the people who work for you 
Land is also another factor of production, and this includes like natural resources, oil, coal, wheat, etc. Capital is basically where you use goods to create other goods. So this would mean like factory equipment or stuff like that. So like the machine is used to make goods. So that's why it's considered capital equipment. And enterprise is basically someone who's willing to take labor, land and capital together in order to make, um, you know, to make a product or provide a service. Without enterprise, um, you wouldn't have entrepreneurs and new companies and startups. It's because certain people take the risk of, you know, trying to get labor, land and capital in order to provide goods and services. So that's why enterprise is essentially for is someone's willingness and ability to take risks in combining other factors of production. So after this, we have the idea of renewable resources and non-renewable resources. So you might have seen this in like geography lessons and stuff like that. And the key idea in economics for these definitions is that um, renewable resources are resources which can be replenished, which um, can be replenished faster or at the same rate as which they're being used. So resources which can be replenished and the amount of these resources um, is maintained over time. What that means is like, if I'm using a certain resource, if it's be if it's renewable, then the rate at which I'm using it is um, the same at which it's being made or grown. So that way my use of it doesn't affect it too much. So a non-renewable resource is the opposite of that. It's a resource which you cannot readily replenish or replace at a rate which is equal to consumption. That means I'm using something faster than it can be replaced, which means if I keep carrying on, eventually it'll run out. So oil and gas, um, for example, at the rate we're using oil and gas, eventually it will run out and we won't have enough of it. So it's considered a non-renewable resources. So the amount of these resources will decrease over time as they use, whereas for renewable resources, the amount of these resources can be maintained over time. So, okay, moving on from there, we'll take a look at economic agents. So economic agents are usually just considered to be a person, company or organization which can influence economy by producing, buying or selling. So basically in an economy, in order for an economy to run, you need you know people in the economy, companies in the economy or different organizations and you know different they either buy stuff, they'll produce stuff or they'll sell stuff. And essentially the idea of economic agents are if you take all of these people in the economy, who contribute to it by buying, selling, or producing goods. <laughs> Anyone who basically takes part in the economy, in transactions and making stuff, etc. All of those are considered economic agents. So I'm an economic agent, you'll be an economic agent. Um, different companies are economic agents as well. The government is an economic agent and so on. So moving on from there, we'll take a look at the idea of opportunity cost. So opportunity cost is the idea of having the next best um, or the value of the next best alternative, which is foregone. What that means is if I decide to buy a Mars bar instead of a crisp packet, then that means because I bought the Mars bar, my opportunity cost was not being able to buy, buy the crisps. So that's the value of the next best thing. So the way I like to think of it is if I do something, what was I not able to do because I did that? So let's say I decided to travel to the beach instead of traveling to the theme park my opportunity cost of traveling to the beach is not traveling to the theme park. So the opportunity cost is, you know, what did I have to give up in order to consume this good? After that, we have the idea of economic goods and free goods. So an economic good is basically a product or service which commands a price when it is sold. And it's considered to be a good that has an opportunity cost when consumed since it uses scarce resources. Pretty much most goods are economic goods. What this means is basically, you know, anything which has a price or product or service which has a price is pretty much an economic good. And that's because when you consume that thing, that means that you have to give up, you know, something else. So if I have to buy a phone which has a price, then though there's an opportunity cost because I have to buy that phone, I shouldn't buy something else. So it's also considered an economic good. And also to make that phone, you know, I had to use up the materials for it, the labor for it, etc. So I had to use a scarce resource. Free good, however, is a resource which is so abundant that its availability is not a constraint in economic activities and it has no opportunity cost when consumed because it does not use scarce resources. Essentially, what this means is stuff like sunlight and the air and stuff like that. If I, you know, get some sunlight or use light in my production or whatever, or I need to use the air, my consumption of the light or the air doesn't reduce how much of the air or light someone else can use. So that's why it's considered a free good. 
Okay, then after that, we're going to take a look at these things. The possibility production or production possibility frontier, margin analysis, economic growth and economic decline. So a PPF, which is a production possibility frontier, is the maximum productive potential of an economy using a combination of two goods or services when resources are fully and efficiently employed. It's basically that graph which you've seen before where you have like good X here and good amount of good Y here. If I produce this much of X, I can only produce this much of Y. Whereas if I produce this much of X, I can actually produce this much of Y. It's the idea that if I make more of something, I have to make less of something else. And if I make less of something else, then I can make more of the other thing which I want to. And the production possibility frontier tells me, you know, what combination of goods can I make and how much of each can I make. So after that, we have marginal analysis. And marginal analysis, the word marginal means like doing one more of something. So marginal analysis is an analysis which involves looking at the additional benefit of doing activity compared to the additional costs incurred. What that means is like, if I do a little bit more of something, what's the extra benefit I get of doing that little bit more and what's the extra cost I get? So for example, if I bought one phone, I had no phones before, I probably have a really high benefit involved and a decent cost involved as well. But then after like getting more and more phones, the additional benefit I get isn't so much, but the additional costs might rise a lot. So marginal analysis is kind of saying, okay, if I keep doing a little bit more, a little bit more of each thing, how does doing a little bit more of everything affect my um, overall amount? Um, and, you know, what happens overall as an effect of that? That's marginal analysis. So economic growth and economic decline are both quite easy. Economic growth is an increase in the productive capacity of an economy, which is an increase in the amount of goods and services it can produce. And economic decline is just the opposite of that. It's a reduction in the productive capacity of an economy, and it results in a decrease in the amount of goods and services it can produce. So this kind of makes sense. If your economy is growing, which you can show by the PPF shifting outwards, then that means that your productive capacity has increased, you can provide more goods and services because the economy is obviously growing. And if it's declining, then fewer people might be working. You might have lots of free factors of production and, you know, people can't work as much. So it's goods and services will decline. So apart from that, we have division of labor. And division of labor is just splitting up um, a production process. And probably I should change that typo. So it's splitting up a production process into smaller tasks and having each person specialize in doing one of these parts. So what this means is like, if I have a factory line, rather than getting one guy to you know get the parts and the same guy builds it and the same guy does something else, one guy's in charge of doing one part, one guy's in charge of doing another part and the, another guy's in charge of doing like the last part. So one person might be in charge of delivery, one person's in charge of putting the things together and one person's in charge of like painting it. So division of labor is breaking up a really big process into small, chunks which are done by separate people who specialize in doing those little chunks and then you've got the free market economy command economy and mixed economy so the free market economy is an economy where the market mechanisms allocates resources so that consumers and producers can make decisions on what is produced how it's produced and for whom it's produced basically if you want to think of it, it just means that the supply and demand curve will basically decide um, how much of something is made because in a free market you don't intervene the government doesn't intervene too much <clears throat> you just leave the free market supply and demand to decide how much of each good is produced and how much isn't if something should be produced less then the demand and supply should just reflect that it's wanted less so the free market makes less of it however in a command economy what happens is all factors of production are allocated by the state so they decide what's made and they decide you know how it's made and for whom it's made so this is more like it's not necessarily communist but like essentially it's where the government will say um you know this is how much i think should be made of this thing or we think you should make this for this person and this is how much you should make the free market isn't deciding how much to make the government is basically you know calling all the shots and saying what's made how much is made and whatnot the thing is these are both quite extreme ends of it so in real life you tend to have a mixed economy for most things where you have both a free market, but sometimes the government will intervene in some resources to say some a certain amount has to be allocated in this way. So this is where most economies actually lie. And finally, we'll just take a look at the idea of money. You've probably heard a lot of things about, you know, this money and someone said describe it. it might not be the easiest thing to describe. So money is a medium of exchange in the form of coins and notes, which has monetary value and is used for transactional purposes. So it's just basically a way of, you know, exchanging value, essentially. How do I know how much something is worth? Well, if I have money, I know exactly how much is worth, how much it will give me. So essentially, that's what money is. 
but basically if you understand these concepts that's all you really need to understand for um the nature of economics in the first chapter and these are quite important definitions to understand overall so hopefully um a lot of this makes sense and i'll put this down below in um the description so you can download the no oh, you can download the sheet and you can just practice and i have found that a lot of the sheets online the definition sheets they give an alphabetical order but not necessarily by topic which i don't think is very useful so i'll be doing more videos on stuff like this where i'll go through each chapter and just give you a very quick explanation about each of the different definitions a lot of them are actually self-explanatory if you've you know revised through economics or you've seen it a little bit in your classroom or revised it yourself um also a lot of the definitions you can just kind of read and it'll make sense and i'll just try and give a little bit of commentary on each to make it a little bit clearer with some examples so if this video was helpful please do leave a comment below and likes it will help me if you can share this around with people you know and i'll continue making more and hopefully this helps and good luck and see you in the next video